A piece of petrified wood sits to the left of my television in our living room. It's carefully mounted on a wooden base set so that light peeks through the openings and the roots and curves of the wood. There are some places where the wood is gnarled and twisted and other places where it's smooth. It is a scholar's rock or gongshi, literally tr translated as respected stones. Scholars' rocks are a Chinese art form. This one was a gift from my grandmother-in-law. And they are naturally occurring stones that have some sort of dynamic feature. And they're not only appreciated for how they look, but also for inspiring contemplation. Scholar stones are seen as a companion, even like a friend. One whose varied angles and textures as you look upon them can lead you to new trains of thought or insights. It is almost like a visual parable. The parables of Jesus are deceptively simple. A story about a good Samaritan is about being a good neighbor. A story about a prodigal son is about repentance, A plus B equals C, lesson learned. Yet, if you take any one of these parables and turn it just a little bit, you'll find that it has something more to teach you. Just as my scholar stone can be turned and looked at in different ways, causing me to notice something new, a parable can teach us multiple things. If you were here last Sunday during last week's youth message, I talked about the parable of the yeast. And I offered one possible understanding of that story. But today I want to take us a few turns of the parable further. Matthew 13, 33 reads like this. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. That's it. That's the whole parable. And you might be thinking, how much can Pastor Sarah really say about one sentence? Oh, just you wait. <laughs> I'm going to focus on three parts of this little parable. The yeast, the mixing, and the flour. Yeast, mix, flour. And before I go any further, I want to give credit where credit is due. My understanding of this parable is shaped by a scholar named Amy Jill Levine. She describes herself, did I just hear a woo? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> uh, Amy describes herself as a Yankee Jewish feminist who teaches in a predominantly Christian divinity school in the buckle of the Bible Belt. And if that's not a biography, I do not know what is. And she is a fantastic scholar, a wonderful resource for understanding the Jewish context of Jesus and how his parables would have been heard by his original audience. I also want to give credit to Reverend Anna <laughs> because I sat with this parable and riffed on it for an hour during Bible study on Thursday. So if you want to know what you're missing, you got, you got to come to Bible study. We had a great time. So Anna, thank you for uh, making the writing of a last minute sermon not too difficult. So first we have the yeast. 
Now imagine, if you will, a sourdough starter. Do I have any quarantine bakers in the house? Anyone who got into baking during quarantine? Yes. So several of my friends got into not just baking, but baking sourdough during lockdown last year. I personally had to babysit more than one dough starter over the holidays going over and carefully measuring out the right amount of starter and mixing in the flour and making sure everything stayed the right temperature. The yeast that Jesus is talking about is not the kind that comes in the packet that you might have in your pantry. It's like sourdough starter, the sticky, bubbly, kind of smelly stuff that makes a delicious loaf of bread. Now, Jesus' listeners actually would have been a little surprised to hear him describe the kingdom of heaven as yeast, not because it was an uncommon metaphor. Yeast was used this way all the time, but it wasn't necessarily a positive. Yeast could be a positive metaphor or a negative metaphor. Jesus himself uses yeast in a negative way just a few chapters later in Matthew 16. He says, watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you think about it, it makes sense. Yeast expands dough just as teachings expand our minds. However, we can grow in both positive and negative directions. A community or a person is susceptible to both bad and good doctrine. Just think about the internet and the ways it has been used to spread important information and not so truthful information. So Jesus's use of this word yeast requires the audience to pay attention. We need to be on the lookout for good yeast and bad yeast, for yeast that expands our minds and for yeast that might sour our spirits. Yeast, mix, flour. So second, we have the mixing. The woman takes the yeast and mixes it into the dough. Don't miss that Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a woman. He's preaching on a woman doing what was woman's work at the time. Household labor, making food to feed her family and the community. So don't let anyone tell you that the kingdom of heaven doesn't include people of all genders. So the woman takes the yeast and she's mixing it into the dough. Or is she? Mm. Here is where our English translation does not do the text justice. The word translated as mixing in most of our translations is actually the Greek word in crypto. So here's the first piece of audience participation. What does the word in crypto sound like to you? What was that? Encryption? Right, encryption or cryptic or even crypt, a place for burial, to conceal or make secret, mysterious. So a truer translation of this word in the parable is that the woman takes yeast and hides it in the dough. Oh, a secret, mystery yeast. Now this could again sound kind of negative. As the childhood adage goes, secret secrets are no fun unless you share with everyone. But remember that hiding is a theme in the New Testament. Jesus himself frequently preaches about things that are hidden, good works, the truth of God, his own identity. 
all of these things are talked about as things that are once hidden that will be revealed. So the kingdom of heaven is sometimes hidden, but like yeast will grow and expand and produce something marvelous. Yeast, hiding, we have to change the second word, hiding, flower. So third, the flower. I shared this last week, but Jesus is talking about a huge amount of flour here. Three measures is between 40 and 60 pounds. That is a lot of sourdough bread. So the kingdom of heaven is extravagant and abundant. We should hear echoes of other stories. The loaves and the fishes, another moment where bread became abundant, or the wedding at Cana, when Jesus creates about 60 gallons, 60 gallons of good wine. That's some wedding. However, this flower has another layer. It's not just about abundance. You might right about now be wondering, Sarah, why did you have Anna read that passage from Genesis if you weren't going to talk about it? Well, I am. I wanna read one section of it again. Here's the next piece of audience participation. And I want to see if you notice a connection. All right? Abraham looked up and saw three figures standing near him. He said, let me bring you a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Okay, what did you hear? Yeah, good job. Three measures, there it is again. Here we have a woman making bread with a huge amount of flour. Now, I would not be, have noticed this connection if it wasn't for Amy Jill Levine, but Jesus's original audience probably would have. Abraham and Sarah are foundational figures, and the audience and listeners would have been familiar with this story as it's the moment when Abraham and Sarah learn that they will have a child in their old age. They would have heard this story again and again and again. This story in Genesis is one of a miraculous pregnancy. It is the story of a child long hoped for who finally comes into the world. It is the story of God creating something marvelous in the midst of despair and loneliness. So here's the last piece of audience participation. Does that ring any bells? Do we have any other stories about miraculous pregnancies? Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other stories of a child coming into the world? Yeah. Or about God doing something marvelous in the midst of despair? What, especially in this time period, might be another story on those themes? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus himself, the arrival of Emmanuel, God with us. So when Jesus is talking about this parable, on one level, he's preaching about his own birth. How profound is that? We can turn this parable in so many ways. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that grows and spreads and bubbles over. The kingdom of heaven is like a secret that will be revealed. The kingdom of heaven is abundant and extravagant. The kingdom of heaven is like a miraculous pregnancy. It involves labor and love. The Advent season is about pregnancy. It's surprisingly, 
there's very little discussion of actual pregnancy. Yes, Mary has an unplanned pregnancy. Yes, Jesus is born in a manger, but we don't actually talk usually about pregnant bodies and birthing. But Mary, she carried Jesus. Just as Sarah carried her, her precious, unexpected, laughter-filled son. Mary carried Jesus perhaps through swollen ankles and morning sickness. And she labored. She labored to bring the Prince of Peace into the world. This is the Sunday of peace. Peace is one of the many promises of God's kingdom. And man, do we need peace. A peace that's unlike anything the world offers. A peace that passes our understanding. God's perfect peace. Yet this parable and its connection to Genesis reminds us that peace doesn't just happen. To quote Amy Jill Levine directly, the parable tells us that like dough that has been carefully prepared or a child growing in the womb, the kingdom will come if we nurture it. We must nurture peace into existence. There are many ways we can do this. We can nurture peace in our own spiritual lives with practices of prayer and contemplation and Sabbath rest. We can nurture peace in our homes and our church family by communicating with grace and love and lending a helping hand. We can nurture peace by seeking out friendships with people and Communities that have different cultures or religious practices. We can nurture peace in our communities through missions and justice, whether it's protesting or voting or organizing. We can nurture peace by understanding the root causes of violence and doing what we can to address them. All of that is labor. It's not easy. But peace will come if we nurture it. Indeed, God is already at work in that nurturing. Sometimes in ways we can see and sometimes in places that have yet to be revealed. But this parable reminds us that something beautiful is on its way. 